Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, EVP of Products and Services here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, we have another guest who will help us dig deep on the topic of security threats and how best to deal with them. If you recall, during my conversation with Bill Harmer on our last episode, the topic of zero trust came up, with Bill giving it his good housekeeping seal of approval as the right way to do security today. With that in mind, I am pleased to have our own James Golden as our guest today. James heads up our development and systems administration engineering team, and he has been instrumental in moving Plow's internal systems and users to a mature zero trust posture. James is the epitome of a digital engineering native, having started working in network administration and getting into some fairly harmless black hat hacking all before graduating from high school. From there, he went on to tech support and field support, all while experimenting with network exploits and programming on the side. He eventually made the move to network engineering and then to a director role at a multi-location media company before making the move to Plow almost four years ago. During our conversation, we hear from James about Zero Trust and what the journey has been like at Plow. We'll get into some of the history of Zero Trust, why it has become the gold standard, and some of the challenges he has faced getting Plow to walk the talk in terms of its own approach to security. I hope you enjoy this conversation with James Golden. James, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, we got to have lunch today since I'm in the office, which was great. Um, I know, you know, one of the things that we're going to get into obviously some specifics around zero trust, but before we did, as a sort of a, I guess a prep for that or a warm up, if you will, um, I know you and your team work a hybrid schedule, and you know when we get into talking about modern workplace and the and the idea of working some in the office and some remote, mm-hmm. um, it's kind of a precursor for this. But tell me a little bit about the hybrid schedule that you guys work, and how does that how have you guys managed to balance that out across the team? Because I know not everybody does the same thing. Sure, absolutely. So. Modern work in the last 10 years has kind of shifted. Uh, there's been a large paradigm shift towards work no longer being somewhere you necessarily go to, but rather being something you actually do. So instead of everyone working a strict eight to five at a designated location, more and more jobs are transitioning more to a pretty much as needed basis and more interested in necessarily the job getting done and less pretty much just showing up. And that in a lot of ways filters out a lot of people who just show up and kind of play around and hide between the lines. Um, but obviously the pandemic forced many organizations to embrace that model relatively quickly. Including Plow. Yeah, including Plow, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Right, because you and me were already, I mean, I, well, I, I guess I'd ask the question, prior to prior to COVID, were, was everybody in the office regular all the time? Yeah, uh, yeah. If anything, our models were pretty much identical to what most of our customer base are now, where we have VPNs, we have most people coming into the office to actually do their work. We had a normal eight to five. Um, based on an on-call schedule. So yeah, that's how it was previously. So with now, with your team kind of, I mean, I know you've got some are here every day, some are here part of the time. Mm-hmm. Do you even notice? I mean, how, how's it, how, does, how does that work in terms of scheduling or uh, in terms of coordination? Have you guys had to make any sort of specific adjustments or has it been fairly easy, do you feel like? I feel it'd be fairly easy. It allows people to more schedule around the times that they feel they're most effective. Um, I'm more of a night owl than I am a morning person. Um, so outside of those meetings that are within the night time, or within the daytime, I prefer to do most of my work actually at night. So it allows for much more flexibility for your end users as well as your obviously your staff members. So yeah, I think we've adapted to it pretty well. And in terms of coordination and tracking, it's not any harder than it would be for a regular eight to five, just a larger window. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that was again not specific to the topic, but related yeah. since uh, these are the kinds of challenges I think that everybody would have. In this particular context, where you've got a hybrid work, people moving here and there, maybe not always being in the same place, and how do you make sure you're aware of what everybody's up to, and that everybody's kind of on the same page, project-wise or work-wise? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's kind of transition and get into um, kind of get into the main main event, if you will. Um, I gave a little bit of your bio on the front end, but give us a thumbnail sketch, kind of a quick thumbnail sketch on kind of your background, kind of how you got into technology. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I was 14. Uh, my parents purchased uh, my first computer for me. It's old, old, old 400 megahertz little NEC machine that CD-ROM didn't work. The monitor went out a week later. Um, so I had to very quickly 
figure out how to rebuild and fix machines. Um, shortly thereafter, after blowing out the fuses on rebuilding power supplies and whatnot and getting involved in the pizza industry, ironically enough, uh, I made a hard pivot towards actual IT work and um, became a field service technician at about 17 years old. Um, and then I've been working in this industry since then, everything from network administration to developmental roles to infrastructure to management. So, yeah. so what what attracted you to it? Do you think what was it was it was it the mechanical side to begin with? I mean, I know you're a mechanical guy, so just was curious what attracted did, attracted you to it initially. The challenge, the fact that it changes nonstop, it's never ending. Uh, too many people, I I feel, are happier when they have a defined job that they just repeat on a day to day basis. There are certain people I find that are very unhappy in those lives, and I would be one of them. So you're looking for looking for uh, dyna- dynamism, wanting something to change. Yeah, if it's not challenging, it's not any fun. Gotcha. All right. So, kind of related to that, when do you, when do you recall kind of first getting involved or thinking about this idea of security? Um, you know, what where was when was that from the beginning? From the beginning, as it relates to high uh, to the amount of workplace and zero trust, or just the beginning just, of security. Yeah, in general. no, no, forget oh. about that for a second. Though. Let's go back. Yeah, oh, just... probably when I was fifteen or sixteen, we were running IRC networks for pirating software in high school and uh, changing grades um, for students that were willing to pay. And um, <laughs> yeah, statute of limitations. I know, right? Yeah. Um, but that, but there were a lot of security mechanisms involved in that. So, for example, back then it was Windows ninety eight second edition, and every time you logged in, it stored your password in a reversible encrypted file called a PWO file. Well, if you just take that home and run a program against it in reverse, you'll get those login credentials. You know, like combine that with a school that all teachers can access other teachers' information. A yeah, relatively easy way to compromise all teachers across the board. Um, so that was a large part of my security background when I was in high school. A leather chunk of that was I was also running as a network administrator for many IRC networks at the time. So we were actually recruiting quite a large amount of people um, for building out actual botnets. Um, at the time, we had actually hidden uh, Java ex- exploit inside of pornography and sending it out. Um, yeah, we had about four to 5,000 compromised machines at one time and during my high school years. And yeah, if you made us mad, we'd kick your butt offline. <laughs> it's a different time. <laughs> well, I, don't, I mean, maybe it's different. Maybe it's not. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure how different it is, actually. it's a, Maybe the technologies are different, but the strategies maybe aren't. The consequences that, are a lot worse now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. More more connected machines means more particular problems, yeah, right? So Exactly. Um. So, kind of, I mean, we've talked kind of at the front end, sort of how you got into technology and kind of the early days as a teen. So let's let's kind of skip some ground and come, you know, forward to today, or maybe not today, but recently. When when was the first time you heard about zero trust? What what when did that concept kind of come into your frame of reference? Uh, I'd say about four to five years ago, um, during the transition towards a single sign-on, and as cloud services became more and more popular, most uh, organizations I was working with and or assisting. We're in an interesting situation where their staff were still stuck on the what I would consider a legacy uh, mentality of we really only need VPNs and pinholes in our firewalls, and so long as everything's in a DMZ, we're fine. That old castle moat strategy that um, sees it as a safe area and everything outside of that as you know a non-safe area or something to be protected against. And unfortunately, with cloud solutions where they have to be accessible from anywhere in the world, it was pretty obvious that most security solutions were coming up short, we'll say it that way, had no visibility into these services, had no additional context around the actual authentication mechanism. It, yeah, it was a, yeah, not a good spot to be in. So the castle and moat, we use that as a description for sort of a, uh, you know, a protected area with a, we'll think of it as a firewall, right? And Mm -hmm. only secure access to get in. But once you're in, the assumption is you can do, you can go where you want to go and do what you want to do because you're trusted at that point. Yes, exactly. Um, and that's unfortunately how most organizations are compromises from within lateral movement once a user account has been compromised, which unfortunately users are still the vast majority of compromise. Right. We'll, we'll um, get to that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I mentioned zero trust. We talked about some on the front end, but I don't want to make an assumption that everybody knows exactly what that is. So can you give us a summary just quickly? What is zero trust? What does that mean? And kind of what are its parameters? Sure. Um, so at a very high level, zero trust is really about a few different things. It's about implementing least um, privilege, which is a pretty standard across the board security-wise, but the most important element of it is actually using login metrics that would not otherwise be available during the context of authentication. Um, the reason that's so important is actually the third reason that makes it a little bit different. That's assuming breach. Going back to the castle moat strategy, once you're across that moat or you're connected to a VPN, you're past all security mechanisms for the most part, for most organizations. 
Um, in an assumed breach model, that would be the case. Every resource you're accessing would be reanalyzed based on your metrics, either what you've been doing past history, um, if your account already has existing risk, if your device is healthy. Um, those elements are the biggest uh, differentiators between the legacy model and our current one. So that methodology, that using additional information to determine the login accessibility at the time for each research, um, probably for each access attempt, is the core component of the Zero Trust model. Um, it isn't necessarily any specific product. It's an ideology on a security approach. Got it. So it's, it, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's an ideology or a, a framework, not a product, right? Yes. And so, and it sounds like in a lot of ways, it's the inverse of the Castle and Moat model in the sense that it's based on the user's actions at every point uh, or really for the life cycle of, of interaction as opposed to uh, in or out. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So in a normal sort of a binary, yes, you're good. No, you're not. And you're done. This one is constantly asking that question. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes. In the previous models, you'd get connected to your VPN. That'd be about the end of your authentication context. And that would only really typically involve your username and password. In a zero trust model, one of the VPNs either don't exist or they're transparent to the user because of device authentication or no VPNs required at all because for every resource that they're trying to access, everything from what that user typically accesses, how the device, if it's healthy, if it's been compromised, is this coming in from a different country? Has the user logged in from a from a place in the United States that couldn't physically have traveled to a time this new login has occurred from a different location? All those metrics being calculated determine a risk score and that applying to the actual access is what makes Zero Trust so much different than oh, you know, username and password, you're good, and you can go wherever you want. It's a very, very different approach. And, and you said it's not a product, and, and listening to you describe it, it's obviously not a product, but it is a set of capabilities. Exactly. Right? So it would be enabled by certain types of products within the context of a security arrangement. Exactly. And so as a, you know, well, let's talk, we'll, we'll get there. I want to talk specifically about Plow, but so I guess maybe hold that. We'll, give, me, give me a second to get there because I want to talk specifically about how you set up the zero trust posture or the zero trust environment at Plow, sure. just maybe as a good example. But why, before we do that, let's go one step kind of up. What, what is it about zero trust that you feel like is, why, why is this the gold standard? When I talked to Bill Harmer on the previous episode, he called zero trust the gold standard. Um, why is that in the sense, is that, is that really just more a function? Would that have been the case 25 years ago, regardless of, of cloud and other technologies, or would it have just been overkill? Would, would it would have still been better? I mean, I guess that's that's maybe what I'm trying to get trying to get at. I feel it may be a little bit overkill if you were to go back 20 years, but not as much as you may think. Um, in terms of its why it would be the gold standard, I believe it's because most of our security methods and methodologies we currently have now are not designed in such a way to support cloud services in a secure, while non-interruptive um, environment. Um, unfortunately, most people will just tack on security solutions to check mark a box and just deal with the interruption to their end users. I'm not really, there's a much cleaner approach with single identity and zero trust model. Um, to your other point of there being different, uh, being more of a methodology, just, just to expand briefly on that, um, whether it be with Okta and your identity provider or Azure AD or any of these others, bringing in metrics from your different security solutions into your authentication context should be the end goal for every organization that's involving any cloud services whatsoever, rather that be as simple as deploying an Okta agent on each device to identify your devices so that only those could access your resources. That would be a good example of a, a, adding an additional metric into your authentication context. Obviously, you can go all the way into Azure AD, all the way up to device compliance and a device being registered, et cetera, and that being brought into the authentication context. But anything in that direction is a huge improvement over what I would consider more of a legacy pinholes and VPNs only with no context. Additionally, um, I'll mention that the other big element as to why I would consider it the gold standard is because we have many organizations that, again, going back to this checkmarking a box, they'll lump in a, uh, say, a SIEM tool to it to pull their logs from all their devices. But if there's no one constantly monitoring that, there's no one bringing all that data together, it's nothing more than checkmarking a box so that they can say they have that solution in place. The Zero Trust model is much more about using modern tools such as AI, such as uh, identifying anomalous actions because I don't, for example, need to know that my staff took so-and-so administrative actions at so-and-so date. I need to know what have they done today that's different than they do on their every other day because that's what I need to know. I don't need to know that so-and-so staff members doing the same thing they do every day. I need to know when they do something weird. Right. Um, so I think that pivot towards actionable information and less towards we're collecting everything so we have 
something to dig through nonstop. I think it's it's a radically different approach and allows your IT staff to focus more on the actual issues of the business to solve technology and less of just paperwork and burning the day chasing non nonsense. Right, right. I mean, your false positive problem looks a lot different. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned it before, but let's go ahead and go there. And that's let's talk specifically about implementing zero trust at Plow. When did you decide that, you know, as an organization, we want to go down that path and begin to talk to Brian and Cameron about that? Sure. Uh, so when I actually first started here, um, one of the first things I noticed was our logins weren't even in the single identity model, uh, meaning that we had our logins were one element, our email addresses were completely different. This entire organization didn't even have the same UPN suffix. We weren't all plow.net. We had some at plowgroup.com, some plow.net. And it was just a big mismatch. Additionally, we had no visibility into the endpoint devices. So we had no vulnerability management. We had no uh, centralized reporting on those elements. Uh, we also had no centralized even security for the, the remote wiping of devices. So if, for example, a employee, for whatever reason, um, needed to be cut off, very rapidly, we, we were in no position to do so. Obviously, being the person who would be responsible in such an event that those issues would then get rolled up to, I decided to rebuild it. Right. So um, those that's no longer the case now. Obviously, everybody's identity is actually lined up the way it's supposed to be. Obviously, we can really wipe your device no matter where you are, where you're at, um, as well as anything done outside of your normal day-to-day -day context. We'll notify the security team and they'll know about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a dramatic difference. So. In, in terms of getting from what you just described, which was probably a pretty typical environment, um, you know, three or four years ago to where we are now, what, I mean, I know it hadn't taken the full four years, but in terms of, in terms of the time to implement zero trust as a posture, how long do you, th I mean, how would you, how would you sort of couch that in terms of the time it's taken? Um, so unfortunately, it's really dependent on the amount of services that need to be integrated, uh, where you're currently at. It took us about a year, but we went rather slow because we're trying to be extremely non-disruptive. Um, I'm a firm believer that most security rollouts need to be done in a non-destructive way. I'm a huge fan that your end users really shouldn't even know about them. And for a large part, I believe our employees don't really know until they either jump on a VPN that they're not supposed to to hide their traffic and then our stuff picks that up and immediately blocks them. Right. Um, that they go, wait a minute, this is a little bit more serious than I expected. Um, and that's the entire point. You, you shouldn't really know until you cross that line. The larger, the larger components of it is really the conversion of the applications into the into single sign-on. So, obviously, they have to support an Open ID standard or SAML or one of the one of those protocols. But converting your applications to that, getting getting away from those segmented identities, being first and foremost, that's typically the largest time sink of it. Right. And then to your point, you slowed. I mean, you stretched that out mainly for for user experience as much yeah. as anything else, or, or lack of disruption. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, are we? As you think about that, are we done in terms of in terms of implementing zero trust, or is it an is it an ever moving, uh, ever evolving process? I, I think with almost any technology, you're never really done per se, and especially as it relates to zero trust, it's continually being expanded and worked on. Um, for example, we use Microsoft products here internally at Plow, and they recently added the ability for us to actually run our own compliance scripts that will report back based on the criteria we define if that device is in compliance, which opens up the doors uh, quite a lot. I'm kind of showing off my nerdiness here a little bit. For whatever reason, that's actually entertaining to me because yeah, I like the idea that if for whatever reason we needed to go find a set breadcrumb on any of the company devices, we could do so and actually identify those machines that aren't. And more importantly, have that actually integrated into our authentication context. So while we already have the, you know, if you're compromised or if something's taken on your machine or if you do something weird, now we also have that element of if we just want this one piece to be there and if not, you can't get access to anything at Plow, we can. So right. we can mix that with quite a few different things to do some relatively interesting results. So I'm kind of curious where that's going to go. When when we think about, and we've, we've kind of been at pains to say that zero trust is not a product and that sort of thing. And while that's all true, it requires a set of enabling technologies to be able to deliver. Yep. And you've mentioned the Microsoft stack a little bit and talked some, you know, used a few references here and there, but what specifically do we have deployed in our environment that allow us to do the things that, that that you need to do for us to be able to say, yeah, we've got a zero trust model in place? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the biggest element of that is that your security products talking to each other. So the biggest problem that we see in previous organizations is their security products will do their job, but at the end of the day, once it leaves the context of that job, 
there is nothing else telling anything further down the line. So, Can you give us an example? Yeah, absolutely. So if, for example, you are uh, you get hit by a phishing attempt, for example, for all your staff, and somebody gets compromised, um, that anti-spam solution, while it may detect that a phishing attempt has occurred after the fact and even retroactively gone in and removed the email, such as Mimecast does, as Proofpoint does, as Defender does this, these are all normal technologies, that won't actually matter that much because the account's compromised and Mimecast slash Proofpoint isn't going to tell anybody else. So, granted, there should be notifications up to your administrative staff. They should be able to track it down and monitor those users, but there's nothing actually reporting down the line. You compare that with, say, the Microsoft stack for their Defender stack. The Defender 365 picks it up as actually coming in during the anti-phishing. The Defender for Endpoint picks it up because it was actually ran on that machine. The identity management piece of it picks it up because that account's been logged into from someone that doesn't normally log into. And all these pieces talk together so they generate a risk-based score based on the user account and the device that at every time they go to access a resource, this is looked at and recalculated, in which case that machine would probably be blocked and the account banned until security actually could investigate and resolve it. Gotcha. And is that does that happen, I'm assuming it's real time to near real time in the sense of its in the sense of that communication and that dynamic scoring. Yes. So in the instance of so let's take the example you just gave of a of a phishing attempt where someone is compromised. Is there enough going on to prevent uh, a full ransomware, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the word, the, the ransomware propagation mm-hmm. down the line mm-hmm. um, where you could, you could enter the, they could intercede on your behalf to prevent, uh, you know, further dissemination of that oh, in terms absolutely. of file locking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, from the most basic level on the endpoint, you can do control folder access where only certain applications are allowed to write outside of certain defined areas. Um, that will prevent any, I mean, it's not approved by your organization to be able to modify anything outside of those areas. Past that, Microsoft has their own backend elements that are actually watching to see. So if your account, for example, all of a sudden goes rogue and starts encrypting multiple SharePoint list libraries, you're going to get flagged and your account's going to get banned anyway. Um, as well as obviously that would be a non-normal thing, so all security staff would be notified as well. Um, yeah, so there are there are definitely solutions in place in your trust model to prevent ransomware uh taking over everything because unfortunately right. in the older model there was no such thing if you were Correct. to breach yeah. a local account or it, get it ran yeah the, the world is open to you that you could lock everything up yeah right? and and so in, the, in, in this case you might not you might not prevent all of it but you could you could prevent a good portion of it in the sense of that and that sort of file locking yeah yeah absolutely um, and mixed with technology such as autopilot Intune with control folder access even if an endpoint did get completely compromised a remote wipe could be issued and it'll come right back up as plot networks machinery log back in their stuff comes back down it's right yeah yeah so combine that with a backup and restore you've got a pretty good solution yeah. um you know assuming assuming all those things are working as they're supposed to be right yeah. yeah um okay well let's talk a little bit about you know when you think about um the process of kind of going from uh, when you got here and kind of where we were security posture wise to now what what what's been harder than you expected in terms of implementing zero trust Again, this is about expectations yeah, relative to, I'm, you know. I'm the best way to answer that. I would probably lean more towards Mac's obsession with designing their equipment for the individual. That find That's a little bit more difficult to integrate uh, with enterprise solutions. Um, we've had a little bit more difficulty with that. Even the login processes like Jam Connect, for example, or nothing more than LDAP query, which is a, what I consider a legacy protocol against Okta or a centralized identity provider. So it's not the as seamless as I would like on the Mac side. Um, but having said that, that would probably be the largest one. The only other one would probably be any applications that are running locally that are based on legacy protocols such as LDAP. Not having a good cloud conversion for that service. Yeah, those are probably the main hangups. Right, because they, they cause challenges in terms of the rollout and then the mm-hmm. ongoing communication and sort of the real-time risk scoring, correct? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and Max, I mean, for the folks, the, the millions of people listening to this podcast may not know this, but we actually do have Macs in our environment, uh, like yep. most people do. Um, it's not uncommon for IT organizations to act like Macs don't exist inside an organization <laughs> and leave them out of the uh, leave them out of the fold, so to speak, because yep. they're a pain in the ass to to manage. Um, that's been my experience almost everywhere else I've ever worked because I've worked on a Mac for a long time, um, and in most instances, it was sort of uh, you know seen as a, a you know, kind of a stepchild of sort yeah. of over there, like 
we don't really want to talk about it much, but we know that they're there, and yeah. that's kind of you know sort of off the grid in a lot of ways. It's kind of but they are they are getting lumped into the fold. So for example, with our solutions, we use Jamf here as well as uh, Jamf Connect, and we have our Jamf connected into our Intune for compliance management. So we still have the zero trust in terms of identifying if a device is compliant mm-hmm. based on our standards and not allowing access if not. Um, Obviously, that's maintained and controlled by Jamf, but it reports into Intune, which is part of our authentication context. So. Right. So realistically, I mean, we can be we're, we're sort of indifferent from that perspective, but yeah. it has been more of a challenge. Oh, yes. In terms of the implementation. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you don't have a background in it, yeah, it could it could be a surprise. What about the other kind of the other direction? What what's been easier than you expected? Uh, definitely the ongoing management and babysitting of it, um, not needing to go through as many logs as I had to in my previous occupation in terms of identifying and going going rogue. Mm-hmm. Um, here, people that are have even remotely gone rogue become very apparent very quickly. Um, you can't even add a person to a group because if you don't normally do that, it's going to get shown and right. they're going to know it. Um, yeah, so the ongoing management would be by far the biggest element of it. Uh, I I love the at the time of access cutting people off. That is a huge problem because unfortunately, most of the time you don't really realize you've been compromised till you've already been right, compromised. After the fact, right? And in which case, you're now just doing a da- damage assessment instead of an investigation. Right. So, um, I'm a huge proponent of that. I think that's a huge. No, I know, I know some of some of our environment is a little simpler because we're remote. You know, I think we're we're just pretty much full cloud. Mm-hmm. But in a hybrid environment, would would the situation be much different or? What, what kind of wrinkles would that throw into the mix? Since so, obviously lots of our customers have hybrid environments and lots of you know businesses out there do. Yeah, most organizations of a decent size are going to remain in the hybrid topology for the foreseeable future. Um, having said that, if a zero trust models what they're working towards, there are solutions in, that are part of the base SKUs in Microsoft, using that as an example, um, for that. So for example, Defender for Identity is a product suite where a agent installed on your domain controllers to actually monitor the event logs of everyone basically accessing where they're going Right. with the entire intention of piping all that into those user risk-based scores so okay. that instead of just having visibility into cloud-based services, you have visibility into your you and your on-prem file servers. So if, for example, Susan in accounting starts going through the IT people's network shares, that will get identified and that and you'll know right. where it is before you have zero visibility in there until something goes wrong. And then even then 95% of the time, the organization never enabled auditing. So there's no real actual trail and it's just. So, so putting those agents on the domain controllers in many ways is replicating what was happening kind of at the, at the Azure AD level in the cloud. Exactly. You know, so let's, let's crystal ball a little bit. We, you know, zero trust has emerged. It's, you know, it's the gold standard. Um, what do you think it means, you know, for more traditional forms of security like firewalls, whitelisting, anti-spam software? I mean, how do you see those technologies evolving, changing, going away? What What's your perspective on some of the more traditional uh, security methods? Is this more just a, another layer uh, in the process or, or are we really leapfrogging? I would say for the immediate future, it's going to be another layer. I think it's going to be at least another 10, 15 years before we start seeing more and more organizations be in a position to actually get rid of on-prem infrastructure and allow their IT teams to focus more on technology to solve problems and less on babysitting hardware. Having said that, it's they're never going to go away, and I'm a firm believer that a security, any security posture needs to be mm-hmm. com- compromised of multiple elements. It's just another brick in the wall. But having said all that, I would highly suggest anything that's on that older legacy model, anything that's only supporting basic authentication, for example, needs to be transitioned, if at all possible, to cloud service on our single identity model so that you have that kind of visibility, that your IT staff doesn't have to keep maintaining these kind of products. Yeah, it's, it's just a better solution all the way around. So this idea, you've mentioned a couple of times, this idea of a single identity, and you know, I assume that folds into multi-factor authentication, mm-hmm. kind of working hand in hand. Do you feel, do you see that as kind of one of maybe the core, maybe even the core component uh, or sort of building block of, of zero trust oh, at, its, at its root? No, oh, absolutely. Um, implementing MFA needs to be probably the first thing that most organizations need to do. Um, it's my understanding that even the newest uh, insurance renewals are having it as a hard requirement. Uh, because it's such a simple, relatively simple in, in implementation that can offer a halfway decent security solution. Because as the paradigm shifts, we're no longer just protecting services on certain ports on certain IP addresses. We're protecting identities because those identities are allow people to walk through all these security mechanisms. So when you identify someone as just a username and password or what is basic auth, you have no context around that, who that person is, what they've previously been doing, um, 
et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the push to modern office is going to be troublesome for certain organizations, but it's inevitable. And there are technologies that allow you to shoehorn in legacy solutions into this model. So, for example, if you have a on-prem application that you need to put behind this model, and needs to be publicly available from the outside, and you're able to do such things such as application proxies to put that behind modern auth, even if it may not support it natively. So there are options, um, but yeah, it's just identifying those services and getting them code over. Gotcha. So in terms of, I mean, when you think about that, at kind of at its root, uh, with the with the right identity, with the right identity management, the right identity system in place, the the security of the boxes themselves is not really as important outside of brute force or kind of DDoS stuff. Is that, I mean, is that a fair way of thinking about it? I mean, not exactly. Yeah, but not exactly, of, but yeah, it's, it's fair because you, you're looking at it more or less. If no one can get on unless we know who they are, then we don't necessarily have to worry about what happens when they're on there, right? Yes, but in zero trust model, you'd have what, what they were doing while on there also being reported in. Right, so, and, and sort of staged along the way based on that action, you'd still shut them down because we don't know who yep. they are. Yeah, exactly. Again, because we're assuming a breach. Yep. Okay, <laughs> got it. Um, when we think about the past five years, maybe even the last one or two with, with, with what we've seen. Um, it looks like there's a trend towards, you know, more compromises, more attacks, um, particularly around uh, end user, right? So, f- you know, we're, we're, we're setting aside, I, I thought, you know, Bill Harmer did a nice job of this when we talked last, last time about separating, uh, you know, the guys that are after money versus the guys that are after political ideology and the, mm-hmm. the ones that are politically motivated is the different, it's a whole different, group you know if they're trying to bring down nation states or whatever that's that, that's over there that's really not what we're dealing with you know and and most commercial customers are not dealing with they're dealing with people who are after cash mm-hmm. um so thinking about that first group it does feel like we've seen more of that in in the in the near past so we'll say last couple of years for sure and what we've seen in cybersecurity insurance points to that right the, mm-hmm. the, the insurance companies have not done well uh, in terms of their loss ratios. So the prices are going up. They're making it more difficult to get insurance. All that in- indicates that there are more problems. Um, so it seems, so is it easier to get attacked or is it just that there's more people trying? And, and, and all that, I guess, brings to the question, is it easier to get compromised now than it was five years ago or is it just more stuff happening out there? It's both. Um, the problem is you have organizations that are, were forced to adapt very rapidly to the pandemic and they needed to change their security models and didn't. So unfortunately, what they did is pretty much take their existing solutions and try to shoehorn in a work from home policy or procedures. Um, but unfortunately, if you have no endpoint visibility, if you have no vulnerability scanning, if you have nothing that's actually keeping tabs on those machines besides basically your updates, which heaven forbid you, you know, we're basing solely on like some on-prem WSUS server and required line of sight for even patch management, you can get in a really, really bad spot um, where a user gets compromised. You either don't know it, they jump on the VPN, they start encrypting all the stuff you can see. If you don't have anything even remotely, they're watching for massive sessions from a single user and won't get picked up on until someone goes to access something and it doesn't work. And by then, most of your file servers are probably already compromised. So I... So it's both. It's more often because so many different companies had to very rapidly set right. up in a way that they could work remotely. Um, and weren't able to put either, for a variety of reasons, couldn't get the, the right protections in place yeah. prior to rolling those policies yep. out. Yep. That makes sense. So that created a you know a vulnerability, a soft underbelly, if you will. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's transition just a little bit. You know, what's been your experience and what what's your perspective on um, you know, end user security awareness training, anti phishing programs. Have you seen these? To, do you is it your perspective, or based on what you've seen, are they providing good results in terms of helping end users do a better job of being part of the security solution as opposed to the problem, just being part of the problem? So I'll say it this way: I think any effort in terms of education and end users' perspective is beneficial. Uh, phishing attacks are the largest uh, vector that's taken advantage of by these bad actors by far. And I mean, it's not even close. It's like 80, 90%. Um, So end user knowledge and training and making sure that they're up to date in terms of how to identify something that should give them pause or that they may need to run by their IT staff, I think is critical. And and you do that a lot with the single model of identity, for example, because if you're getting asked, for example, for your credentials, but you don't see your company logo there or 
it looks a little odd or there or you have an actual single sign on methodology so they shouldn't even really be asked that should be you know uh, alerting your staff that maybe something's wrong here um, so i'm a huge huge proponent of um, attack simulations and internal training because it's much much better to find out where your shortcomings are ahead of time than after sure yeah. sure and i mean is it your perspective that you would include or you would consider end user security awareness training or anti-phishing simulations as part of a zero trust protocol? No, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, while it's not technically part of like the core elements of it, again, it's, it's not a brick and security wall and it's the most exploited attack vector. So yeah, by right. far. Okay. So final question, um, kept you for a little bit here, um, but, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with a little bit of personal stuff on the back end. But when you think about the current state of cybersecurity, I mean, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic when you look at the future going forward? And that can be, you know, short to medium term to long term, you 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 can define the, the time ranges when you think about your your level of optimism or pessimism. It's somewhere in, in between the two. I'm pessimistic solely because I see organizations take the zero trust and just throw that on products that they're selling. You know, may not talk to anything else whatsoever, um, solely to get things more sold. But that's just been going on throughout time. Um, but I'm also more optimistic because more organizations are actually starting to embrace a, a cloud first mentality. We're seeing that as more and more um, are wanting to design their entire organization around um, these type of methodologies and technologies. So yeah, I'm going to lean toward optimistic. I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with a little bit of personal stuff. I always like to ask just a couple of questions just to give a little bit of flavor of, of James Golden for the world. So I know you like to tinker. Um, you know, you and I, have, you've told me about some of the stuff you've gotten into, but um, maybe you can tell us something that you've been working on lately or something you've watched or, or learned that you think would be interesting to share with others. So I think I'm working on is a little bit weird, but in my defense, the squirrels attacked first. Um, so... Uh, my truck, for whatever reason, the scores have gotten in there, and apparently Toyota used some soy-based wiring during this year. So basically, they like to chew all the wires around. Well, I had, in your around your engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've already had to uh, lost two days, unfortunately, re-soldering and repairing wire harnesses. But um, back to the uh, the actual war. So <laughs> I had already written. I needed a reason to get into robotics, and I wanted to kind of pick up Python as a side language. So I basically started building a little turret or whatever that would, would track stuff, right? And right now it only tracks humans' faces. So um, what I'm going to do is swap that out with a thermal camera and actually feed it to Azure AI to see if I can identify squirrels. And yeah, I basically just have it sit there and hunt squirrels all day. <laughs> I don't care. No, they, they attacked first. They went into my truck, so it's on. <laughs> so I'm building Squirrel so Skynet. J James Golden, Squirrel Killer. All right, yeah. so we got that to we got that to look forward to as, a, as an update on the next podcast. So. <laughs> um, all right, last question. You talked a little bit about the computer that your dad uh, gave you back in the day, but we want to go back further than that. What's what's the first technology you mem memory you have as a child, and it can't be television? I think it would be... See, prior to that computer, um, I think it would probably be first grade when I was suspended from school for getting out of the, uh, they had us locked into this little like lock-in kind of thing where we're going to run like nine or 10 like programs, but you could just hit like shift escape, get the terminal and like exit right out of that. So uh, yeah, I got like two days of in school suspension for that. Uh, I think that was the first one, um, at least I can remember. Uh, yeah, that's probably around that. So you started out as a hacker. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. When your kid, you don't have any money. You gotta, you know, need seven hundred dollars for a car. You gotta make that money somehow, I suppose. <laughs> All right. Um, on that note, we'll let you get back to it, James. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Cut the shit. It's been good to talk to you. It's a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at cuttheshit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok, at cuttheshitpod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.